segment on autism. My name is Dr. Brown and I'm a member of the Sweetwater Church of Christ here in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm a pediatrician here in Jacksonville, Florida. Today our purpose is to discuss autism, what it is, uh, the types of autism, myths and facts, and then also talk about our struggles and our blessings of parenting a child with autism. Today's speakers will be myself and also Sister Kelly Denton, RN, Clinical Educational Specialist, and Sister Lavette Tolan, who is a paraprofessional. So first I will discuss what is autism. So autism is a broad range of developmental and social conditions that affect a child's social skills, speech, and behavior. It can impair a child's ability to communicate and interact. Let's go on to the age groups. So typically it can be very difficult to diagnose uh, autism before the age of 24 months, okay? Um, but some children can start showing signs and symptoms between the age of 12 to 18 months. It's a very common diagnosis and we get approximately 200,000 cases per year. Moving on to risk factors. So risk factors is that boys are more common than girls. I'm not sure why. Um, it's a ratio of four to one. So for every four boys is one girl that's diagnosed with autism. Family history, so if you have a cousin or um, another sibling with autism, you have a, a possible higher chance or risk factor of having um, a, a, another child with autism. Um, also extreme pre prematurity, so a baby born with low birth weight is also a risk factor. A genetic conditions, also environmental factors like heavy metal exposure, and then also if you're born to older parents, okay? Next we will be having Sister Lavette Tolan discuss the autism spectrum. There are three levels as now, they, the way they diagnose kids. Um, level one is for kids um, who have social issues, but they are able to, um, they're able to function without, with little help. Um, with them, it tends to be uh, decreased interest in social interaction. Uh, they don't do sign, the signs of communication is difficult. It's like with my son, he will speak, you can talk to him, but he's not going to conversate with you. Uh, level two is uh, autism requires substantial support. The, the, the symptoms associated with this level include a more severe lack of both verbal and nonverbal communication. This often makes daily activities difficult. Level three. This is the most severe level of autism according to the DSM-5. Those at this level require very substantial support. In addition to a more severe lack of communication skills, people with level three autism also display repetitive or restrictive behaviors. So it's pretty much, um, they get set in their ways. Kids who are more severe have worse issues with um, changing environments. If you say you're going to do ABC and you go to, to DEF, there, it's just their whole day is gone. It's, you just don't blew it. And um, with those kids in two and three, it, it's a little more difficult to deal with them. But they can be dealt with and you have to just let them know ahead of time, hey, we're not going to Walmart first. We got to go to Winn-Dixie because I have to do that with my own son. I give him a schedule and then he's fine. The way it's diagnosed is that um, they will send you to, uh, back in the day it was early steps, now it's called early intervention, and they will send you there for your child to be diagnosed. 
And with that being diagnosed, they, they go through all kind of testing. They go to speech therapists, they go to developmental, they do occupational, and they'll, they'll do these tests and then they'll find out and say, hey, your son, has, your son or daughter has autism. Jared was diagnosed at one and a half, so we knew pretty early and were able to jump on it. Before three years old, all the services are free. All the therapies he got were free. So he was able to get the best, best um, therapist teaching him. And also, you can also start school at three years old. So that's another thing that works for the kids. From three to five, you give you preparing them for kindergarten. Some will go into inclusion, some will not. Thank you, Sister Lavette, our paraprofessional, for discussing the autism spectrum. Now we will have Sister Kelly Denson, our RN and clinical education specialist, to discuss myths and facts. Hello, I'm here to talk to you about seven myths associated with autism. Myth number one, autistic people are all alike. That is a myth. They are not all alike. They are all different. They're all individuals just like we are. So you cannot lump them into a group with one another. So that is a myth. Myth number two, autistic people don't have feelings. That is also a myth. It is incorrect. They do sometimes have a hard time developing empathy um, because they have a difficult time guessing a person's cues or their feelings based on their body language. However, it does not mean that they don't have feelings. And once you integrate appropriate responses and actions into their routine, they are actually very empathetic people. Myth number three, autistic people are a danger to society. That is incorrect. Just like everyone else, they do have triggers that can sometimes cause an outburst that is deemed as aggressive or dangerous. However, as part of their treatment plans, they deal with this so that they're able to control it appropriately. Myth number four, autistic people don't build relationships. That is also a myth. It is incorrect. Autistic individuals are able to build relationships. They're able to get married, start families, um, have jobs. So that is totally a myth and incorrect. Myth number five, autistic people have heightened intelligence levels. That is also a myth. People tend to lump all autistic people together with different individuals like Mozart. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Rain Man, that is not accurate. Yes, you will find that characteristics in some individuals, but it is not um, something that's necessarily seen across the spectrum of autistic individuals. Myth number six, autistic people have no language skills. That is actually incorrect. These individuals are able to hold conversations. Um, some not only have um, great vocabularies, they're also able to learn sign language and communicate that way as well. So it is a myth that they have no language skills and are unable to communicate because they do. It's sometimes different than the way we communicate, but they are able to communicate and express language skills. Myth number seven, autistic people have little potential for success. That is also incorrect. It does depend where you fall on the spectrum, just as Sister Lavette Tolan mentioned a little while ago. Depending on what level they fall in, they do have a higher chance of being successful individuals that are able to function in society unassisted. However, the higher on the spectrum that the individual falls, it does make it a little bit more challenging and they may require lifelong services. Thanks for listening in in regards to the myths associated with autism. These are just a few of the myths that are associated with autism. There are several more out there. This is a very intriguing group of individuals. 
And since we have so much time on our hands due to social distancing, this is a great opportunity for you to read up on it. Um, look at some videos maybe that are available on YouTube so that you can interact with these individuals better when we are opening up our community again and you can have a greater appreciation for this population. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lavette Toll and I am a paraprofessional. And yes, I do have a son who has autism. Autism does not have him, but um, he is 21. Um, as a mom struggling with raising a child that has autism, um, it, it affects me. It affects me as far as depression because that, that's one thing that affects us. And it, with autism, um, it affects your marriages too. It puts a strain on you and a lot of people over the years that I've been in the system have been married and find out years later they're divorced. So I'm one of those people too. But um, the thing about it is that from day one, Jared has been in the church. And everybody, I tell people, you see Jared, when he was little, it takes a village. And I still believe that to this day, it takes a village because I need help. And I have several sisters here that help me out a lot. Um, Roslyn, she is one of the speech therapists that used to be at his school and she helped him a lot. And she, she um, keeps me calm because I get emotional about it. And even if I talk about it, just thinking about him, I would never change the way he is. I would, if, I, if one day he wake up and he's a, he's a dormant Jared, I'll be happy, but I like my Jared. But um, sometimes with that, Jared has frustrations. And to help him, um, the school had made this book about frustrations. And it just goes through the process of what Jared does when you get upset. Who do you talk to? And it has like his speech therapist. I mean, it has um, his, his behavior um, teacher. He has um, his psych coach. It's just things that we go through the process saying, what we do when we're frustrated, you gotta calm down. And then I carry a card, I know you can't really see it, but I carry a card with his behaviors from one to five. So sometime when he's sitting beside me, I say, where are you? And he'll say, I'm one, meaning he's calm. Now, if he's at five, he's angry, and I have to do something immediately to calm him down. But he is a blessing, because like I said, I always ask God to please, please, please give me some patience. And Jared was born, and it took patience. I had to do a lot of teaching. I, I had speech therapists, OTs, um, developmental therapists, everybody. They would um, give me suggestions on how to help him be a better child, because he would not step on grass. He did not like standing on grass when he was two years old he will fight me. And he had a sensory issue too. So a lot of kids that have autism have sensory issues, but what I started doing when he was little, I would um, wash him, lotion him down from head to toe. So he'll get used to feeling and put pressure points because a lot of them is pressure. And with them, you have to, sometimes you get those joints and you massage, you pretty much they're getting a massage. So I do that to my kids at school too. But he is, he is my joy. He brings out the best in me. And with his two brothers, they help out a lot. And that the thing about that, they, I have never asked them to take on the role of helping me with their brother. They voluntarily help. And they go around the house, Mama, Jerry need to clean up. You're right. You help me. It's a village, remember? Help everybody help each other. But, um, but overall, <sighs> I'm good, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with where he is now. For a 21 year old to be where he is and be able to handle himself, it, it makes my heart filled with joy. How to approach Jared. We, Rosalind and I have been working on asking for hugs. Don't assume someone wants you to hug them. And if they say no, you have to accept it. So that's why I tell people when Jared come running up to you, now that we have the situation going on, really, just he's been um, online every day with his teachers. They've been telling them how to 
deal with this, what they're supposed to be doing. So he's getting to the point. He's learning space. But the thing about it, with Jared, if he comes up to you and you don't want him to hug you, you just say, Jared, uh, either um, you don't have to say anything verbally. You can just redirect him. I mean, when we were able to touch, if he came toward you, you know, just grab his hand and shake it. But now, um, it's going to be hard. I'm still working on it as far as bringing him in public. I have not brought him out yet because he's a touchy-feely child. And he will run up to people and hug them. And right now, I'm still trying to figure out how to deal with him in public. So, but yeah, Jared, as far as interacting with him, he, he will talk. Just make sure it's not, they don't like eye contact. So the thing about them, you know, I always be like, Jared, look at mom, look at me. What are you doing? Or are you okay? So, um, but yeah, just get his con, just get his eye contact. And if you don't want him to hug, just say no, thank you, Jared, and just redirect him. And pretty much he, he listens. He will listen. He really is a good boy. So, other than that, um, as a mom of autism, um, I just have my church family. I have my school family too. They help me out a lot. My blood family, I, I have three sets of family, so, and they all three have been very supportive with me. And I just say, just, just work with me to make him a better child. Oh yes, every, every April we have the Hill Walk, that, um, the money that is raised is for the, found, the Autism Foundation here. So every, every year around this time, at the end of the fourth Sunday, we always have the Zoo Walk, and it's about $15. But, um, but they didn't do it this year because of what's going on. But, but yes, that's one of the things we do is the hill walk. Um, we do, um, let's see, got the hill walk. Yeah, and then October, we also have um, autism events too, but that one is more broad. And that one we don't um, really participate in because we like to see our money go into Jacksonville, not out of Jacksonville. So. But overall, so next year, we're focusing on, because they already got the paperwork out for next year. Um, so hopefully, um, maybe I can get some people to walk with me. But it, the only thing about it is on a Sunday, and it's in the morning. So that's the only time they do it. I would like to thank our speaker today on our segment of autism, which is always in the month of April. We would like to thank Ms. Kelly Denson, RN, Clinical Educational Specialist, and Sister Lavette Tolan, our paraprofessional. We thank you very much for tuning in today, and we hope and pray that you would find our segment informative. Thank you.